Thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening. I appreciate your we time. We are so glad to have you here. So I'm going to start at the beginning, like I yes. did with Jorge. Um, I think that your childhood is really interesting. I've heard about it many times. I know your personal story, but you grew up um, in public housing, mm -hmm. a single mother, mm -hmm. and you found a real safe haven in sport as a, as a young girl. Tell us a little bit about sort of your first interactions with health, fitness, and sport. Well, basically... My mom was like, go out and play. <laughs> and um, no, but to be really serious, she kept us in organized sports as a way to keep us out of trouble, which was really good because um, it helped me improve my self-esteem and my self-confidence. And it just gave me that overall attitude that I can achieve anything. And I kind of took those elements and, and it really helped me also just in school and classes in general. So then that same... I have an older brother, so I was always playing sports with the boys, and you gotta be good to play with the boys. <laughs> They're not gonna pass you the ball if you can't catch and you can't throw. So um, a lot of things, it just gave me that ambition to wanna be the best that I could be, because I wanted, I wanted to play. I wanted to be like, put me in. <laughs> so definitely, that was a great start. And you've mentioned to me before, something I think is really interesting is that it's great for anyone to play sport, but it, particularly for young girls, that there's a special yeah. relationship. I mean, over the years, I've worked with the Women's Sports Foundation, and um, particularly, they have this incredible campaign called Keep Her in the Game, because girls tend to drop out of playing sports at around the age of 13. They feel like they have to decide, like, do I wear hair, do I put on lashes, or do I go play soccer? <laughs> And so they really don't have to decide. They can still be really girly and then still go out there and play sports. And the benefits of uh, research has definitely shown that girls who play sports, it increases their self-confidence, it increases their self-esteem, and they're also more likely to like their bodies, so they have better body image as well. You, you talk a lot about body image. In fact, um, one of the things that I think is really amazing about the work that you do is your programs focus on getting a better body or sexy abs, and, and you know that people care about looking better, but mm -hmm. it always comes with the yin and the yang because you also talk about it's just as much about feeling better, about feeling good about the way you look. It's not all just about the body. Um, tell me a little bit about your philosophy and why that drives you to always make sure that you're telling both sides of the story. I mean, I have accepted being... I come from a science background, obviously, with the degree in human kinetics, but... Early on in the industry, it was easy to see, and also with research from URSA, the International Health and Racquetball uh, Sports Association, they've done a lot of research, and we know that people want to work out to look good, <laughs> right? But the reality is, is that it helps so many other things. So whether it's a workout DVD that's called Sexy Abs or um, something in that frame, my whole approach is definitely to educate that person and let them know that yeah, you're getting this great ab workout, but overall, more importantly, what's happening is, you know, you're decreasing your risk of heart disease, you're decreasing your risk of cancer, you're strengthening your bones so there's less chance of you having osteoporosis. So, like, all these other amazing things are happening um, that are important to the longevity and to you just feeling good about yourself every day. So, one of the things that's incredibly unique about you as a personal <laughs> trainer is that we hear about celebrity trainers, and we know there are lots of people that train celebrities, but you and Jorge train celebrities. I mean, the list is long, <laughs> right? And the big guns. Yeah, and I know from, from training a few celebrities that my experience is it's not exactly the same as training folks that are not real celebrities. So knowing that your client list is full of people kind of on that A-list, how is that different for you? And how do you switch back and forth between your regular client in the morning and then another celebrity and what they're, what's different in their expectations? The biggest difference, well, first of all, whether it's someone is a celebrity or a housewife, human anatomy is exactly the same. <laughs> so we, you know, the approach and how to get the results is the same, but you have to produce results because someone who is, um, who is high end, basically what happens is they have access to the best of everything. So it, whether it's the best chef and the best hairdressers and the best makeup artists and the best doctors. So if you don't produce results, then they're going to replace you quite quickly. So it keeps you on your A game. Yeah, it keeps you on your A game just in making sure that 
what you are doing and how you're designing their programs, that you're really listening. I think that in any kind of profession, the most important thing if you're serving a population is to listen to your clientele and really give them what they want. So when a client comes to me, it's not about, oh, you're going to work out with my program and do it my way. It's, okay, what is it? You know, how can I help you? What is it that you need to work on? You know, it, and then it's a specific design to help you achieve those results. It would be, you know, it's like everyone has had that feeling where they've gone into a doctor's office or gone to see a professional, and you're like, did he hear a word that I said? <laughs> because he totally is not, or she, but, you know, women always listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's my one moment joke. <laughs> you got to keep the fun factor in there, right? But um, the point is that we have to listen and it, and it doesn't matter what profession that you're in. If you do not listen to your clients, then you're going to, you know, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble when it comes to producing results for them. So that's number one. So one of the interesting stories, I think, of you training your celebrity clients is with Pink before she went out on that amazing world tour where... She wasn't just singing. I mean, it was acrobatic. And I mean, it was like a Cirque du Soleil show on stage. <laughs> and you told yep. me that um, she went out on tour, but to prep her for that was a year-long thing. Tell us a little bit about sort of what you learned and what you had to do to get someone ready for something that physical. Well, prepping Pink for her tour is just like prepping any athlete that is specific, that you're sport-specific for your goals. So with her... I would have to go in um, and see some of the choreography with her choreographer, so I knew exactly what she would be doing. So I knew, and on top of it, her body was a little bit more, um, what it's open because she had just had a baby. So I think that the journey when a woman after she has a baby uh, of coming back to her peak strength, it's um, it takes a little bit longer. You got to be a little bit more patient with them. So uh, it was just a matter of seeing exactly what was going to be going on through her routines and making sure that she had the strength and flexibility to achieve those <laughs> those feats of hanging upside down and swinging off of silks while she was singing and still keep her body in um, and keep her safe. So I imagine it would have been really great to be in the audience at one of her shows looking at her performing that. That's, that's like true girl power of like preparing for something super challenging and then getting to see one of your clients up there doing that. How did that feel? You know, it, it, it's, it's always great when I can help any client and it's even bigger. The greatest thing of working with clients like the Pinks or the Alicia Keys is that what happens is when they take care of themselves, the ripple effect of people seeing their strength and their, um, their awareness to health and wellness, it affects so many more people. And that is the most rewarding for me. So yeah, when she takes care of herself, all her fans are like, I need to work out. <laughs> and that there's nothing more beautiful than the ripple effect of that decision. Now, I know you've talked a lot about people focus on working out and even when they get really consistent and maybe in some cases even really hardcore, mm -hmm. The workout isn't the whole story, and that sometimes uh, they're working out, but their body's actually not working. Yeah, uh, the education of exercise, we always want to encourage people to, you know, work out on a regular basis, but we also want to be aware of our anatomy and what is going on and understanding that sometimes there are issues that are happening in our body, and the type of exercise that we're choosing might be increasing the risk of that injury, whether it's knee injuries. You'll hear a lot of people, I love to run, I love to run, but my knees are killing me. Or um, I have this crazy lower back pain, but I love to spin. So it's understanding that, okay, here's a perfect example. You, I'll use the hip for an example. Every day we sit, this is flexion of the hip joint, okay? And then we walk around, more flexion of the hip. <laughs> and then we choose for our form of exercise, spinning, which is more flexion of the hip. And then we're like, oh my God, my back is killing me. And we are like, but I have no idea why that is. And we're usually taking some kind of pain medication to address that lower back pain when it usually is this beautiful group of hip flexor muscles that originate from your lower back and they insert into your femur. They literally wrap around. And when they get tight from that overuse, 
they pinch on that sciatic nerve, which creates pain. And so the importance is the balance, is that sometimes we gotta get off the spinning bike and take yoga class and open that hip up. <laughs> and just to, the lesson in all of it is that we have to listen to our bodies, not just the physical of the outside or musculoskeletal system, but also the internal. So for example, after you eat a meal, if you're eating something you feel indigestion or you're constipated or all these things are indicators that we need to address something that we're doing either was it, if it was that meal or if it was an activity that we're doing on a regular basis. And we have to not ignore those signs. And when we ignore them, then you get in these situations, if we go back to the hip, hip replacement has doubled in the last 10 years. So this is a, just one example. There's also knee replacement. I could tell you the whole story about the knee. <laughs> but to finish on the hip, the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. It looks like this. It does rotation. It rotates, it abducts, it adducts, it flexes, and it extends. But what we do all day, over and over again, is flexion, 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 flexion. So that's your anatomy of the hip 101. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Certified what? by Jeanette. Yeah. Um, I want to ask this question because I, as many years as you've been training, you've seen a lot of different clients, but I bet you see common things people do to sabotage their program or to sabotage their nutrition or to sabotage their wellness. Mm -hmm. what, what in your mind is, I mean, it's not the same for everybody, but no, no. if you could mention something that you think maybe is a common denominator for a lot of people. I think for most, from my opinion, as a fitness expert, is just... The self, I find a lot of people self-sabotage because of their lack of awareness of how powerful they actually are. That how powerful every single daily choice is in their life. So, for example, when you make, it's understanding that every decision you make has a ripple effect. It goes beyond the moment that you make that choice. So. For example, if the, I wake up every day and choose to exercise because I understand that when I exercise, I'm going to have that ripple effect of a strong heart that's going to decrease my risk of cardiovascular disease. I also know that it's going to boost my mood, so I'm going to feel great, so it's going to decrease my risk of depression. But I realize that this is powerful, and it's powerful, so I make this choice every day. I don't look at it as just a statistic in a book. And, um, and just how you perceive every single situation and knowing that, that you have a choice in that. So I can give another example. For example, if you were to go into a coffee shop and get a coffee and you're walking out and someone knocks you and that coffee spills over you and the person who knocks you just runs out the door and you're like, seriously? Did that just really happen? <laughs> and you're mad and you're pissed and you're upset about the person who did it and then you carry it on. So that choice that you made to be upset now carries on to the next few moments of your day or sometimes even longer for the whole day because you're holding on to that experience and you're making it live longer than what it actually was. And you created, for many people, you've created a story in your head of what that situation was like that person was rude they were ignorant I can't believe they just knocked me and in reality that person just got a phone call from their nanny it was a woman and their child was just rushed into emergency so they just ran out the door and they had no idea that they even knocked you so it's understanding that Every, how you choose to perceive a situation is going to not only affect that moment, but is going to affect several moments after that. And that that is very powerful. So every time, every time you choose a decision of how you perceive something, it's understanding that you then have to live in that decision. You have to live in it. So if you choose to be pissed off, you have to live in being pissed off. You have to feel that emotion for as long as you choose to live in it. And I really think that people, they make choices and decisions based on knee-jerk reactions sometimes and not so like, oh, I'm hungry right now. I'm gonna grab a snack. I'm gonna grab a chocolate bar or a candy bar. Or, 
you know, I don't like the way she looked at me, mm, and I'm going to be upset about that or angry or take it personal. So it's just understanding that that choice is not about that person on the outside. That choice is always about you, and it's always going to affect you more than anybody else. And I, I think that when people really realize how powerful they are and how powerful every single choice that they make is, that those that they then will make better choices and they will also uh, ex achieve greater success. That's probably the biggest common denominator amongst most of my high-end, very successful clients is that they realize that every choice they make is extremely powerful. We could probably end there. That was good. Um, so, so own your power. Yeah. Every single choice. <laughs> so when we were in the green room, you shared a little bit of this with me. And I went, I'm like, save that. That's so good. And now I'm, I'm enthralled by it. But um, you also shared with me that when you are in those moments, yes. understanding that that's happening um, is an important part of it. And then also having your own way of getting back to the space you want to be in. Yeah, protecting. You that. I call it protecting your mind, body, and spirit in a sense of... You are responsible for the energy you bring somewhere. If I want to come up here and smile and be happy and give you positive energy, but you are also responsible for all the energy that you allow to come in. So if someone is bringing negative energy towards you or if there's something that you dislike or some chaos that's happening, you do not have to allow that inside. That mind, body, spirit, this is all you. And understanding that power I use a lot of meditation. I make all my clients meditate. <laughs> right, Cole? <laughs> Cole is family. Hi, Peter. And uh, they know very much that I love meditation. <laughs> so I think a lot of people hear meditation. They get a little bit overwhelmed by that thought. Like, is it cosmic kumbaya? Is it hard to do? No. Is there a simple... Like, yeah, here. Do you want to try a little bit? Yeah, you guys want to meditate with me? Yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> Cue the doves. No. <laughs> or the music. <laughs> what I want you guys to do is bring your thumb and your finger together like this. So we're, we know what we're doing with our hands. And you're just going to place it on the top of your thighs. I want you to close your eyes and just roll your shoulders back. So you try to sit up nice and tall, making a nice long spine. And now I just want you to focus on your breath. So we're just gonna take some nice deep inhales and exhales. You're gonna inhale through your nose and you're gonna exhale through your lips. Nice deep inhale. Exhale through your lips. Again, deep breath, inhale. I want you just to continue that deep breathing now empty your mind, no thinking about what you have to do for the rest of the evening or what happened before you came in here. Just allow yourself to focus on that breath coming in and out of your body. Nothing else is happening but that breath. Now as you're breathing, I just want you to feel the calmness that comes over your body. And I want you to realize that you own that calmness, that is your peace and you can access it at any time. As you continue to breathe, I'm gonna get you to set an intention for this year of 2016. So it can be a small intention, it can be something very broad where you just choose to see the positive in everything that comes your way, or it can be something very specific to your life but I want you to choose an intention and continue to breathe while you think about that intention. Nice deep inhales and exhales, just focusing on your intention. Now I want you to visualize yourself putting your intention into action. What does that look like from beginning to end? See yourself starting the steps that are necessary, making the choices that are necessary to put that intention into reality.
feel how powerful your mind is, your thoughts are. i like you to bring your hands to your heart center so your hands are in prayer position. Your eyes are still closed. Again, deep breathing, inhaling and exhaling. Now, as you look back on 2015, I want you to think of three things that you're grateful for. And as you think of those things, I want you to feel the cells in your body change. Feel that positive energy of those things in your life that you're grateful for. Now I want you to smile. Your eyes are closed and you're smiling and I want you to feel the power of a smile. How that changes the cells in your body. And at the end of our meditation, we say namaste, which just means to give thanks. So when you're ready, namaste. How do you feel? Did you feel a shift in your body? Did you feel a change? You feel how powerful you are. So we just did that for, what, two minutes. And it's just to recognize that the decisions that you make, they're very powerful. And that you can protect your spirit at any time. So now I know <laughs> why you have such a great smile. That's your tool. That's almost like the, the weapon. Oh, but wait. At the end, I always say, now do the namaste dance. So stand up. Come on, it's another feeling of joy. And you just kind of do a little two-step <laughs> shake and it's the namaste dance. It's just because like you finished, like you did it. And meaning you're congratulating yourself for doing something the positive. Happy dance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Jeanette, one of the things you've done, thank you for that, by the yeah, way. Yeah, now thank you know you. why the clients yes, train with thank me, you, right? Yeah. It's for the fun factor. It's yeah. really just for my jokes. Yeah. <laughs> you would not want to watch me dance every day. Um, so one of the things that's been great about your fitness career is you embrace social media really early on. That was very important to you. And in fitness and in health, often social media is used almost exclusively as a brand statement. It's really about making sure that your name is known because you can reach a lot of people that might not normally be able to come in and train with you. And it's about the brand, about the brand. But what I think is really interesting about what you've done as I follow you is it's also about you almost training hundreds of thousands of people that can't be with you, which is kind of the opposite of how personal training started, right? One client, yeah. one goal, one hour. So you've really broadened the way it can be used. And I'd just love for you to share a little bit about the way you think about what you post and what you do. Um, when social media started, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> because I've been in the industry for 20 years, and when you wanted to reach people, you had to either go through you know, a television show or an infomercial or something like that. So I was like, you just post a message and people will read it? <laughs> and I was like, this is fantastic. So um, I decided I wanted to carry the mission statement of my brand is to inspire and educate as many people as possible to live a healthy life. And I wanted to use the power from both my knowledge and education in the field as well as the power of several of the clients that I work with to just be able to get that message to as many people as I could. So one decision I made right from the beginning is that I wouldn't post anything that wasn't positive. So I never, ever, ever, because I don't want the ripple effect of that negative energy. So I will only put words into the universe that are positive. That was a... That was a conscious choice, and I still do it to this day, is that if it's not positive, I don't post it. And then um, the second is just to interact, is that I realized, wow, like when I get feedback from someone, they'll tweet, they'll be like, I love your workouts, and I'm in Monaco. Or someone in everywhere from Australia, Africa, you name it. And I was like, this is fantastic, and it inspired me to launch um, an online healthy living club, because I was like, it's incredible what we have access to in LA and just the experience that I have to be able to reach that and just to inspire more people. You know, nothing fills my spirit with joy more than knowing that, you know, I've helped somebody else think of fitness from a different perspective. Like, okay, you know what? I am gonna work out today because yeah, I didn't think about that, that 
17 million people around the world die every year from heart disease, a preventable disease that all we have to do is get up and start moving and we can decrease. It's still crazy to me sometimes when I think that heart disease is the number one killer worldwide and in America. And all we have to do is to start being more active and make healthy choices. So things like that. <laughs> so so tell, if people are in the audience and don't know about the online club, yes. tell a little bit about what the experience is. So my club is called the Hollywood Trainer Club. And that's the web domain as well. And basically what I've done is I created a way to feed people information that is spoonful a day at a time. So every day that somebody signs in, whether they're from Australia or Africa or here in the United States or Canada, when they sign in each day, I start every day with a positive thought. So I give them a quote for the day, which is what was today's quote. <laughs> Today's quote was, one of the most powerful things you can do is take responsibility for your life. Your choices, your actions, your life. And then every day I give you a workout to do and your meals for the day and a nutrition tip. And your workouts are actually streaming. So you can do them from your phone. You can do them from your computer. You can do them from anywhere. I literally was doing my workouts from my phone in Brazil, <laughs> like while I was there for a couple of weeks. And you should have seen the people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> but you know, I actually work out to my own workouts. <laughs> and I do it because I want to, <laughs> I want to interact with the community that's in there and in an, um, and the people who work out with me so I know like what they're experiencing. So when I design, you know, challenges and weekly regimens, I actually feel what it feels like and I know what they're going through. Like, yeah, I'm sore today from that power yoga workout we did yesterday. <laughs> so that's kind of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, so question: You work yes. out to your you work out to yourself. Do you ever irritate? You ever irritate yourself? <laughs> oh, if you can you hear the like, words I like, say. No, no, not one more squat. Yeah, just no. one more. You're like, no. I mean, not don't one get more. it wrong. I I love taking other people's classes too. In fact, there's someone here today. Her name's Petra, <laughs> and she's an incredible instructor. And she's one of the people who inspired me at the beginning of my career, as well as Jay and so and Patrick Goudeau. And like, I take everybody's classes, but um, when I take my own on video <laughs> I fly all kinds of words that I can't repeat right now but I, my most usual is that girl that's what I call it. I'm like that girl that girl's crazy <laughs> what but it makes me understand like how my clients feel and I just sit there smiling <laughs> So philanthropy has been really important to you, and I yes. know you're involved in a couple of organizations that I, I think it would be great for you to share about because um, there's one that's rather new and one you've been involved with for a while, and both yes. of them are, are sort of focused on, on, on kids and activity yeah. and that kind of thing. Well, the one I've been involved with for a while, um, I got involved uh, with my client, Alicia Keys. She has been involved with Keep a Child Alive for, I don't know how many years it's been. Was it you guys had... The, the president is here today, Peter. And so um, I've been involved for about five years. She's been involved for numerous, numerous years. <laughs> and so um, basically they raise money to, um, find, to, buy me to bring medicine to children who are suffering from HIV and AIDS and also all of the health care that goes around um, the people who, or the children who, uh, have HIV and AIDS in, in Africa. And so it's everything from, you know, helping them have, again, the, the additional care that they need and, and also doing social programs to boost their self-esteem. And they even incorporate yoga into their, their regimen. So uh, that's definitely one of the organizations that's dear to my heart. You must have been really <laughs> proud of Alicia because she did the New York City Marathon this year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Her brother, who's here, Cool. I have motivated her to do it. And I was just like, uh, you guys? Uh, I still haven't done a marathon yet. And I've, I've ran a 10K and a half K and I, or a half marathon, but I'm like, okay, y'all inspired me. I was like, where do I write the check? Or I'm, I support you. <laughs> because, but it's fantastic when you do, when you can combine fitness and working out with philanthropy, it's always very inspiring because it's, whenever you can extend, I fully believe in using your blessings to bless others. And the second organization I just got involved with this past year is with my client pink and it's unicef and um they are doing a program called kid power 
And basically what it's about is getting kids in America active to create the next generation of givers. So then there's an app that you can download and when the kids are active and they build up these activity points, it unlocks food for malnourished children in other areas of the world. So you're letting these kids see that just that they can be active and their activity is helping out someone else. So we're trying to, to get them to be the next generation of givers. Is there ever a cheat day for Jeanette, and what does it look like? Like, if you're not, oh my god, you're not hilarious. doing your thing. Like, what does it look like? I do have cheat days, but when it comes to activity, I just really enjoy being active. I'm like a 16 year old boy on a snowboard. Like, that's my idea of fun. Like, I gear up. You have no idea that I'm a girl underneath there, and I just start shredding. Like, I love being active. So even if it's not. Um, uh, actual class or teaching or training someone else, I do get joy in just doing extracurricular activities that are. That and I know you've, you've really promoted that as a philosophy that it doesn't have to look like a gym workout to be effective for your clients or for people, you know, that are just living everyday lives. I just mean, I really think it's important for people to change their perspective on fitness in general, instead of it being something as a chore to do, that it is something that you can enjoy. And then being open to trying something new and not always feeling like, oh, you know, I can never ski or I could never snowboard or I could never ice skate or I could never, but like really allowing yourself, I'll never forget the first yoga class I took. Like I am obviously type A, extrovert. Like imagine me in a yoga class, like can she stop talking please? <laughs> I thought these people really do this for an hour and they don't talk? <laughs> How does anyone not talk for an hour? <laughs> It was used to drive me nuts. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to try this thing. <laughs> I'm going to go in and I'm really going to. And the lesson I learned was that, you know, I was judging the situation. And I was putting, again, I was telling the story. And I was choosing to put it in a category that it was like, why do people do this? Instead of allowing myself to be open and experience what I could learn from it. So when I changed my perspective, all these beautiful things I had experienced. And then you have that first yoga class where you cry <laughs> because it touches a place inside you because you were peaceful enough and quiet enough to actually hear your inside voice of what could possibly be going on in your mind and mentally instead of everything that's happening in the outside world. So. Um, that was just an example that I wanted to share, and, but I really had to start off as a beginner because also I was, I'm a mesomorph. There's three body types, and I'm a mesomorph body type, which is more athletic, and the other two is ectomorph, which is more like your long, lean model type, and an endomorph, which is a little more voluptuous, you know? <laughs> and so basically a mesomorph tends to be more stiff. We are not naturally flexible individuals. <laughs> so in a yoga class, we already feel like here I am type A, I want to win the race and I'm starting from ground zero again. So again, it was another life lesson that I was able to learn to help with other people is that you have to allow yourself to be a beginner, even every day, every new experience, and that we all have to start from the beginning on that journey of a new goal. And it doesn't matter if you're 25, 35, 55, allow yourself to be a beginner. You don't always have to be the expert. <laughs> Speaking of experts, yeah. I'm going to share a secret um, that I know about you, which is I learned a long time ago that you have sort of an obsession with the Olympics. So much so Not that like obsession. you're scoping out your you're scoping out your place to stay, and then you go there and shut down and like park it at the Olympics to hang out. You and know, everybody gets their inspiration from somewhere. <laughs> so, um, what is it about the Olympics? So, you know, you're going to Rio and you're going to be there for a month and I already know that like if I want to reach you on that month it's like a five day delay and yeah and you, you've done that for you know London you did it you've done it for many years yeah is, is Park that, City yeah exactly is that is that like your thing is that a thing you do and what, what is it about it I mean it's obviously the Olympics that's great but most people if they can even get to one is a big deal you go to so many <laughs> you know I started off as you know like in the beginning of my industry or beginning was as an athlete and so being an athlete has stayed inside me. And then, of course, working so many years with an amazing company like Nike, 14 years, it's just like you, there was that. And then the connection, I have also trained a lot of uh, Olympic level athletes. I've worked with Serena Williams, <coughs> Sean Johnson, the gymnast, 
Chris Bosch, a basketball player. Um, it goes on. Uh, Carmelita Jetter, she's our world fastest sprinter. So what my inspires me is to see someone make a choice to dedicate to something. And they remove all the distractions and just focus on that goal with everything they've got and achieve it. And I think that that can be translated into any area of life and that no matter what someone's saying to them, like, you're not big enough, you're not gonna be fast enough, you're not gonna make the team, that they just remove it all, and they just focus, and they put in that work every day to achieve that goal. And, um, and even in the end, if they don't walk away with the gold, they have learned so much along that journey, and the biggest is that how powerful they are, that they made a choice, they made it to the Olympics, they stayed dedicated, and that just inspires me <laughs> to the ninth degree. So you're, you're gearing up for Rio then? I'm, gearing, I'm gearing up for Rio. Yes. <laughs> so clients go off the wayside. Yeah, but and I will be doing away. some beach boot camp workouts in oh, Rio, I'm sure you will in be, my yes. club. I'm sure you will You be. know yes, it. Yeah. <laughs> So I would love to open up the conversation. I'm sure that many of you have a question for Jeanette or if you've been thinking about it, and if not, this is your opportunity to ask this amazing world-class health and fitness expert. So we're gonna raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone around. Let's start, I always like to start in the back. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, question for both of you. I'm a um, professional DJ and a yoga instructor, so music oh. is a big part of how I work out and I just um, curious, how you both, uh, both as a technology end and uh, in the end, you know, how do you best use music to get into your flow and mindset? Did you see that move? <laughs> that was nice. good. What's, what's your name? David. David. What's your DJ name? Uh, I was born David Joseph Rubin, so DJ Rubin. DJ Rubin in the house! <laughs> I said do that. Thank you. <laughs> and my answer to that question is I am like a walking fitness DJ. <laughs> if you knew the number of playlists, I mean, for fun, sometimes I go back to like how many uh, ways of, of content, like how it's changed, meaning that like when I started, we started on tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went to DVDs, <laughs> and even on tapes, like we went from tapes to DVDs. You and do now we're realize on iPods. there are people sitting here that don't know what a tape is. So I know. You're, you're talking about it like they even know it. But, <laughs> but the fun part, I know those aerobics tapes that were like already programmed at 155 beats a minute. But um, it's changed now. If you like, for us in fitness, the and this era of 2015 is incredible because we can just change our playlist daily. Like, we used to work days and hours on playlists, and it's like, now we can just change it. We can use other people's playlists. Like, it's fantastic. I use music every day. I change it up. I got my hardcore rap stuff for certain people who need that music to motivate them. I've got my yoga flows and my Buddha lounges. I've got my R&B um, music to for my Pilates and stuff. So yes, all day long, I play music. <laughs> so we have, um, let's go to this side right here. Question. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. Um, my name's Alexandria, and much like yourself, I have uh, completed a half marathon and a wow. 10K before, but I'm training for the full marathon this year, and I've just thank run you. and thank you. Which Congratulations. one? Um, I want to get into the New York marathon, but I there are some barriers to entry. Oh, um, wow. So I'll I'm going to run through with New York Road Runners this year and hopefully uh, place well enough to get on a team. So... One thing that, one obstacle I've run into uh, being in New York and being originally from Florida is the cold. So I'm training now and it drops down to 16 degrees. And I know you're from Canada, so cold is nothing to you guys. <laughs> Do you have any advice for a runner on how to gear up or how to best prepare for the cold and how to just run through it? Suck it up, buttercup! Training in the cold will make you tough. <laughs> it will make you so tough that when you finish that workout, the rest of the day is going to be a breeze. That's my best advice. <laughs> but no, on a, on a musculoskeletal side, is just really make sure that you warm up, of course, because you're in the cold. Um, and then make sure you have good training gear because really, if you have gear that holds in the heat and, he and helps your muscles stay warm, then that will also help. And choose paths, uh, routes that you know, where you know the terrain so there's less chance of you like slipping on ice or getting a pothole. 
and stuff like that. And run indoors sometimes. Find some of them indoor <laughs> indoor tracks <laughs> or on the treadmill and stuff. You don't have to do all your hours outside. <laughs> and we're coming back next year to hear your success story at the end. And yes. now that Jeanette signed up as well, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've accepted it. Yeah, I will be running happening. for Keep a Job Alive. I, I already know it. You heard it here. Because it's like, after this, they're never going to, it'll be like, Jeanette, you said. <laughs> Trapped. Let's, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Let's go back to this side here, and then we'll come into the middle. Hi, my name is Monica, and I'm with Keep a Child Alive, so we welcome you to join our team if you don't get in the lottery. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm looking forward to running with Jeanette this fall. So you can run with me. We can yeah, talk look later. Look at all if you this want. connection all this happening. happening. Yes. That positive vibration. You see those choices, and then they hit the next choice and the next choice. All that positive stuff. I love it. Okay, next. <laughs> so, well, my question is I'm actually coming back from a femoral neck stress fracture. I had an injury here. Mm. And so I have to kind of relearn correct form because I wasn't running correctly, apparently. So I'm not very in touch with my body, and it's hard to know what I'm activating and when I have something wrong and this and that. So I'm wondering if you have any tips or suggestions for being in touch with what's going on with your body. Educate yourself is the best thing that I can say. There are so many free workshops that so many of these athletic gear companies put on with some of the best experts in the world. And look and find where you can take workshops on learning how to run with proper gait, which is, you know, your gait is how you actually run. There's all kinds of, even running shoe stores where you can go in and they will test your gait and give you a prognosis of how, of the things that you need to change. Then also uh, work with a group, like there's all kinds of running groups that have built-in professionals that help you learn exactly what you need to do. Also weight training wise, because remember that overuse on your joints, you wanna make sure that the joints are strong so they can withstand that constant impact of the same motion over and over again, as well as the flexibility work. So you want to have a well-rounded follow. And then on social media, follow some of the best runners in the world, the long distance ones. Find out who that, tweet them. What, what do you do? Who are you, who do you turn to when it comes to, um, you know, information. And so we have so much information out there today that really it's just a matter of you making the choice to <clears throat> sit back and take in some of the, of the information. And the great thing is that when you learn more about your body, that you own that forever. And it's, it's very powerful. We're going to go right here because she's had her hand up since the very beginning. Hi, Jenna. You look ready to run, too. Hi. Yes. Okay. <laughs> My name is Jessica. Um, I'm also in fitness. I teach fitness classes. So I'm wondering, um, as a fitness instructor, as a personal trainer, we have to give so much of ourselves, so much energy. Um, so how important is it for us to get into a habit or ritual that we can connect and tune in with ourselves? So I want to know how important that is to you and some of your rituals, like what motivates you so that you can then motivate your clients to be at their best. So how do I fill back up? Yeah. Yes, because this is a profession where you give, 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 and like most people who are passionate about their professions, they give, 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 and then they feel empty. And caregivers are actually number one on the list for people who are least take care of themselves, and they're out there nursing and taking care of everyone, but they don't stop to take care of themselves. So. I really tuned into the research early on and to how my body was feeling um, probably uh, in my late 20s because I started when I was 10. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I started when I was 16, which still feels like I was 10. And then by the time I hit my mid-20s is when I was starting to feel the overuse on my body and the drain and my adrenal glands and different things that were happening. I was like, this isn't good. This isn't healthy. And I'll tell you what I did. The first thing I said... I don't work weekends. So that was number one. That was my choice. So Saturday and Sunday, Jeanette's not training you on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> Monday through Friday, baby. But so that was the first. So the weekends are my opportunity to re-back up. I need to re-up my spirit. I need that calmness. And then um, other than not working the weekends was making sure that I had a variety, a variation in the types of training that I did so I wasn't getting overuse injuries of doing the same thing all the time. So that's why I have so many different certifications and various methods of training. It was, it was to educate 
my clients, but it was also to educate myself so that we weren't getting these overused injuries. So it's across the board by having that additional knowledge. Then instead of you teaching 15 spin classes a week, you might teach two spin classes, a yoga, a Pilates, and a cross training class or something. So it's more varied. Each class is different, but it's very important. And for someone else, it might not be weekends. Maybe it's Wednesdays or the middle of the week that they take off. But <clears throat> I think the biggest part in that is understanding that the joy of your life is the everyday, is the interactions that you have with other people and that it's not the reward that you're getting at the end. So if you don't give yourself an opportunity to enjoy that and do things that you enjoy as well, it's like, why are you working so hard? So you can get a bigger house, so you can have another, you know, a high-end car or a, a a high-end purse or things like this. It's like we want to work but also enjoy our life along the journey. You don't get, the enjoyment doesn't come at the end. The enjoyment comes all the way through. So, you know, you got to make the decision. And then when you make the decision and you put the parameters, everybody around you will respect the boundary lines because they know, oh, okay, she doesn't work weekends, so let's book Monday through Friday. <laughs> Great advice. So Jeanette, I said this before you came out. I've known you more years than I want to say publicly. And um, you've been- Probably 20. <laughs> yes. You've been an inspiration to me and to many people for a very, very long time. And it's um, our real pleasure to have you here today. So thank you very much for coming and for sharing your wisdom, your inspiration, the meditation, and all your tips. Thank you again very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Jeanette's going to stick around for just a bit. If you want to take some pictures and come up and say hi, have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you again.